gobble, gobble, gobble. Happy we, Thanksgiving, everybody. We are back with more Trashy Divorces listener letters, Alicia. I love it. Welcome to Trashy Divorces, y'all. We've assembled a few different listener letters today, hopefully to help you out with the holiday. We want to give our American listeners something to ease into their food comas with. Uh, for for the rest of you all around the world, I you know... Basically, if you want to be an American about it, get some turkey, get some mashed potatoes. Get some pie. And eat until you can't eat more, and then eat more. And then take your pants off and eat more. Yeah. Bonus points for fighting with your family. (laughs) And that's how you do Thanksgiving, everybody. Woo! (laughs) Happy Thanksgiving, y'all. We are excited to be here today. You're going to kick us off with... I have a story that should be a screenplay. Oh, I can't this wait. This is delightful. Do it, do it, do All it. Right. So this story, it's so helpful. Um, our listener included a little like TLDR at the top. Like, what does this have? Two secret prison boyfriends, FBI, FBI raid, <gasps> self-purchased engagement rings, lies on lies on lies, alleged money laundering, what? stolen iPad, and lots of what the actual fucks. Oh, my God. <laughs> okay. So our fast friendship started in high school. It was her first year attending a public school. We'll call her Prison Patty. Oh, my God. The story is going to be great. This is great. We had a tight-knit group of nerdy, goody-goody friends. There was Prison Patty, the Mormon, Jesus Jill, and myself. Like, oh, my this, God. Seriously. Like, this is great. The screenplay will be ph- phenomenal I, for I'm this. in. Okay. We made it through the next four years without heartbreak, fights, bad grades, or anything that would be considered bad behavior. The craziest thing to happen was Jesus Jill met her boyfriend on the internet circa 2000. And he was moving from the East Coast to the West Coast to be with her sight unseen. So she was missing high school graduation to meet him. What? Like that was their big kerfuffle. Yeah, that's not the Mm -hmm. big. Yeah. Wow. Fast forward. Jesus Jill. Yeah. Fast forward one year. Jesus Jill is happily in a relationship with her internet boyfriend who was not a murderer. Fantastic. Prison Patty tells us about her new boyfriend that works in construction in Palm Springs. Due to his crazy work schedule, we haven't met him. Oh. But we've seen pictures of them together. Okay. Prison Patty tells me they're going to get engaged soon. (gasps) And so as 19-year-olds, you know, we were all really excited. We thought if we weren't married by 25, we might as well just die since we'd be spinsters. That's (laughs) entirely true. (laughs) (laughs) Prison Patty asked me to go to the jewelry store to pick out her ring because her boyfriend, Dirty John, wants her to have the perfect ring. And since Prison Patty has perfect credit, it's best to finance it under her name Oh, no. I thought, well, that's weird, but you do you and live your best life. If you're happy, who am I to judge? We all get invited to a dinner at a chain restaurant because Prison Patty has an announcement. She reveals to the rest of our friends, I'm engaged. We all shriek with happiness, oh. order a round of virgin cocktails, and as we're cheersing, oh my God. there's no. one more surprise. My fiancé is not actually a construction worker in Palm Springs. He's in prison. No. The whole table went quiet, with the exception of the Mormon. Prison Patty had confided in her (laughs) because she was the least judgy. I express all my concerns to her and worries, which led to us taking a break from our friendship. (laughs) Strike one. Wow. Our break lasted three years. The Mormon and Jesus, Jill, and myself remained super close, and the Mormon remained close to Prison Patty. So uh, the listener gets pregnant and has a baby. The Mormon asks if... um, she would be open to inviting prison Patty to the baby shower because she has a not prison fiance and she would like to reconnect. <laughs> oh, good. So prison Patty wised up. Ish. Before the, oh yeah. no. Okay. Uh, I agree. And we reconnect for a few years. Prison Patty breaks up with her non-prison fiance and ghosts me for reasons I still don't know. The Mormon kept her updated on prison Patty. Next boyfriend was a cokehead. Like just Whatever. They were together for seven years because she was raising his daughter. Uh, Once she escaped that nightmare, she reaches out again because she wants to sort of start life over, get a fresh start. She's moving back home. Okay. Has no friends left besides the Mormon. I cautiously agree to see where things go and see if we can reconnect. Jesus Jill told me I was crazy and shouldn't trust her as far as I could throw her. But being the eternal optimist, I agreed to give it a go. Okay. Prison Patty tells me she has a new boyfriend. I ask the obvious question. Is he in jail? (laughs) She tells me no, but he lives in Mexico City. Oh, my God. Uh, We became much better friends than I expected. The next two years go great. She's at my house every day, picking up my son from school, taking him out to just hang out. 
She tells everyone I'm her sister and claims my mom as her mom since she's never been close to her family. Prison Patty gifts the kid an iPad. Jump ahead six months. And Prison Patty admits to me that her boyfriend is in prison in Mexico City. <sighs> oh, I ask why. Prison Patty. And Patty, she Patty, said, Patty. oh, nothing too serious. He'll sh- he should be out soon. And he wants to move to San Diego. Thanks to Facebook, it suggested that I look at a post that Prison Patty commented on. And who was it? It was her prison boyfriend boasting about being featured on a National Geographic special on the world's toughest prisons. <gasps> National Geographic profiled Prison Patty's boyfriend. Wow. Okay. After watching this video, I was <laughs> dumbfounded. Prison, <laughs> prison Break. This is the boyfriend's nickname now. Prison Break was in prison oh for murder. <laughs> No. Prison Patty had gone to Mexico City several times and sent me photos of them together. I was not aware at the time that he was a murderer. At this point, me and Prison Patty were spending every day together. She had moved into my cousin's apartment with her two kids. Oh, my God. We were in a happy friendship marriage. She did all the things with me that my real husband didn't want to do, and she was practically my other half. I invited Prison Patty to Taco Tuesday to confront her about prison break. Oh God! When I asked if when I asked her if she knew Prison Break had a featured special on National Geographic, she admitted to knowing, called me a snooping bitch, and stormed off. <sighs> I feel like the anger is a little misplaced here, Prison Patty. We took another break for about a year. She is still living with the cousin. Jesus Jill tells me to stay the hell away from her and no more take backs. Jesus Jill, We're yes, with you. yes. Yeah. Love your friends, but wow. The Mormon is still her ride-or-die friend. Prison Mm -hmm. Patty comes crawling back, saying she lost everyone because of prison break. (laughs) She missed our friendship. She missed my son. She missed our dogs. We were her family. Blah, blah, blah. I hesitantly accept her back on the conditions that we cannot be in the same car together. She can't come to my house, and she's not allowed to take my child anywhere. No. Prison Patty had admitted to me that she was sending prison break money from his friends. All I could think was some young gangster was going to rob her or rob my house, thinking it was a stash house. Mm -hmm. I wanted to live and not be shot or kidnapped. These are all very good thoughts. Super smart. After about six months of friend probation, I was starting to trust her again. Until? There were no more secret phone calls. She swore she wasn't with prison break anymore. I could finally breathe. 7 a.m. Oh, no. Knock, knock, knock. (sighs) Hi, I'm Agent Blah 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 with the FBI. There were three of them. We believe you have been a victim of a crime. Me, I have not been a victim of a crime, but thanks for checking. They asked if I had an iPad. In fact, I did. The one prison Patty gifted my child. Oh, Apparently it was stolen. The FBI doesn't show up to your house for one stolen iPad. Mm -mm. The FBI then questions me about prison Patty. How do I know her? How long have I known her? Is she a criminal? They had all the info of everyone that lived in my house. It was crazy. (laughs) That would be very upsetting. I give them the stolen iPad. They thanked me for my cooperation, left me their cards, go on their way. I immediately text Prison Patty to let her know the FBI came to my house and confiscated the iPad. She calls me in tears, asking me what they wanted, what did they ask, etc. I let her know it wasn't too much, mostly how I knew her, what she did in her free time. Oh, no. At the time, she was working a full-time job and had a part-time job at the mall as well. Okay. An hour later, I get a call from the Los Angeles FBI on caller ID. Hi, this is Agent Blah Blah Blah. Did you tell your friend we came to see you today? (sighs) Of course I did. You didn't tell me I couldn't tell her. A few hours later, I get a text from a number that is not in my phone. It's Prison Patty from a number that is not hers. She lets me know the FBI confiscated her phone and she would be using this new number until she gets it back. I ask her what the hell is going on and she says, I'll meet you at your office. I have to give you something. Oh, my God. What is this? Uh, Shows up to work with a new iPad from Best Buy in the bag and proof of purchase. She lets me know she, in fact, has not stopped seeing Prison Break and that she has sent him over (gasps) $15,000. $15,000? Distributed to different accounts. What the actual fuck? I was furious and told her I could not talk to her. Don't tell me anything else because I don't want to testify against you. Jesus Jill was in the middle of adopting a son, and I was one of her references, and getting tangled up in an FBI investigation could jeopardize the adoption. Two weeks later, 6 a.m., ring, ring, my cousin is calling. So your friend Prison Patty just got arrested by the FBI. They raided my house. They ripped up my furniture. They tossed my kids to the ground and stuck guns in their faces. (gasps) 
Oh the, my God. The search warrant says something about money laundering, accessory to kidnapping, aggravated assault, and other crazy things. Jesus, Peter and Paul. Mm. I reach out to her half sister to let her know the very little information I have. I felt like I shouldn't be the person to let her parents know that she was raided by the FBI. Her sister tells the family, thanks me for giving them a heads up, lets me know she'll take on everything from here. Two days later, I get an angry text from Prison Patty telling me I'm fucked up for calling her family to let them know what happened. I should have kept my mouth shut and minded my own business. She's adamant she was not arrested and everything is fine. You're in jail! I've got the federales hanging yeah. out in my driveway. I sent her an email formally separating from her and outlining the conditions of the separation since she was so intertwined into my family. Oh, my God. So here are the here are the terms of their separation. Okay, visitation of child. There will be absolutely no communication with my child via phone calls, text messages, FaceTime, email, or social. Do not send gifts for holidays birthdays do not ask about my child to any mutual friends or my family visitation of dogs there will be no visitation do not send gifts or treats as they will be sent directly to the trash disneyland pass as this was a gift i will continue to pay the monthly premium until it expires <laughs> roller skating beach time please do not go roller skating at the beach monday wednesday friday from 4 30 to 6 30 p.m oh my god i love this Favorite taco restaurant. Please do not go to the taco place on my skate days. <laughs> Sorry, I got a real no, kick out of this. This is part. all very specific and good breakup advice. Yeah. No, like claim the claim the breakup. Eyebrow lady. I go to the eyebrow lady on Fridays. You can go any other day or you can find a new eyebrow lady. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Shared friends slash service providers. I will not disclose the reason we are no longer friends to our shared friends and my family as long as you abide by the above requests. Wow. She did eventually violate the terms of our separation by oh, texting God. my child. No. Um, she was apologizing that she wasn't a good friend to me and asking him to tell me that she missed me. I was furious. It's been three years since the FBI knocked on my door exposing my ex-friend. I've recently, I've recently learned she got married to a non-prison boyfriend. The most laughable thing is she reached out to my cousin, whose apartment was raided by the FBI, to make a wedding cake. <laughs> oh, to make the wedding cake um, and sent her the gift registry. Oh, but did not invite her to the wedding. There you go. That's oh. cool. One million trash cans. Sorry for the long email, but I thought you might get a kick out of this story. Whenever I find myself missing prison patty, I just think about the FBI raid. What a flaming, lying trash can mess she turned out to be. Thank you. Wow. And seriously, I can't wait for the screenplay. This is... God, he was just going to star and direct that. That's a... Yeah. Fuck. Prison Patty. <laughs> the Mormon. <laughs> Jesus, Jill. I love it. I, it was a... I really... Yeah. Fantastic was... story. Thanks, listener. Yes. That's awesome. Okay. You've got... I've got a coded name. This is from Sherry. Okay. Sherry. Sherry wants to preface the story by advising you that there is bad behavior from all parties involved. Sherry is in no way proud of some of the things that I'm about to tell you. Good disclaimer. <laughs> Sherry does say it's trash gold, so she digresses. Okay, Sherry says. A couple of important points to keep in mind. I am the product of a very dysfunctional marriage. Dad stepped out on mom for 28 years of their 30-year marriage. Yikes. I grew up thinking this was normal, and this was just the thing that we don't talk about. Sherry is a Leo. Husband number one was a Capricorn. Husband number two, Pisces. The current beau in the situation, and last, because she is not nuts enough to do this again if this one doesn't stick, is an Aries. Okay. Okay. Fast forward to 2007. 2007. I was a sophomore in college and incredibly sheltered. I was working as a sandwich artist with one of my sorority sisters in order to pay for my books and sorority dues. Very wholesome. <laughs> we happened to have a store in a strip mall next door to a video store. The hot guy from the video store would come in all the time. Enter husband number one. Uh-oh. We're going to call him Chad. Oh, God. All right. I was smitten. We wound up dating my first real serious relationship, and we were engaged within three months. Long engagement. All things were going well. We were set to be married in January of 2010. May of... 2009 rolls around, 
And Chad's father, sadly, is killed by a drunk driver. Yikes. Chad goes off the deep end. Mm -hmm. He had been a medicated bipolar for years, but his mental illness was well kept in check. Chad stopped complying with his treatment Uh at that point in time, and his personality shifted. Yeah. Suddenly, Chad was manic. He had major suicidal ideation the whole nine yards. Sherry sticks it out. We went through with the marriage. About this time, Chad got his trust fund money, which was relatively substantial at seven figures. Mm. Please keep in mind, we had both been broke college students prior to this time. We used a chunk of the money and bought a four-bedroom, three-bathroom house. I continued to go to school and work two jobs in order to help make sure the bills were paid and we were not relying on that trust fund money to stay afloat. Chad, on the other hand, continued to experience massive mood swings and became verbally abusive. Suddenly, Sherry is fat, lazy, worthless. Yikes. Fast forward to February 2012. Sherry beats Chad home, checks the mail. I had a bill for an American Express card I did not know existed with a balance of $26,000 on it. Oh, my God. Cue a major meltdown on my part. I went to the bank. What did he? We had $3,000 in our checking account. I confronted Chad about the issue and never did get a straight answer as to where all of the money went. Although I have a sneaking suspicion he developed a taste for nose candy. That would, yeah. So his seven-figure trust fund had been reduced to 3000 and a $26,000 credit card bill? Yikes. She was never able to prove the possible drug. Mm-hmm. Throw all my money down the drain connection. So take that with a grain of salt. Uh, Sherry... <laughs> Chad does manage to do enough damage to Sherry's finances to drag her through bankruptcy at the ripe old age of 23. Oh, my God. Hashtag winning. (laughs) That's what she wrote. Yeah, I'm sure. Uh, Okay. This is terrible. This is terrible. Though I am now incredibly relieved I did not have any children with him at the time, all of our issues were compounded by the fact that we had tried throughout our entire marriage to get pregnant and were unsuccessful. Hmm. I filed for divorce that March on the grounds of irreconcilable differences. And as we live in a no-fault state, I moved back in with my mom while I got back on my feet, only to find out two weeks later that Chad had been sleeping with my maid of honor. What? As well as another one of my bridesmaids throughout the entire course of our marriage. Oh, my God. I later found out Chad had gotten a vasectomy, which he then reversed. Yeah. So you are going to let your wife struggle with infertility issues when you've had a fucking vasectomy and you're not, like, like he secretly mm-hmm. had a vasectomy. Yep. And then yep, after, yep. then when they divorced, he got it reversed. Um, I'm not sure when it was reversed, but Chad is now married to that said maid of honor and they have a child together. Oh, this is brutal. So Sherry says that one stung a little bit. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 The icing on the cake for divorce number one, he got to keep that house that I had completely renovated. It was foreclosed on six months after our divorce was finalized. Hmm. Enter husband number two. Okay. I'm going to call him Steve. Mostly because I cannot think of any kind adjectives for this piece of work. Uh Uh-oh. Sherry meets Steve at a concert while going through divorce number one. We hit it off immediately. Things are hot and heavy. About six months in... Steve starts showing his true colors. He was insanely jealous of my first husband, who I still had to have contact with as we were finalizing and untangling our affairs from one another. Steve wanted to know where I was at all times, who I was with. I ended the relationship in October 2013. Two weeks later, I found out I was pregnant. Yikes. I was 24 and really wanted my child to have an intact family because the nuclear family I grew up in was so healthy. So she goes back. The relationship was volatile before we ever said I do. Steve made comments about my weight gain throughout pregnancy. Yikes. After I gave birth. You're growing a human. What? 
Uh, After I gave birth, he would track my phone to see if I was being active while I was home on maternity leave. Oh, my God. And went as far as to hide the TV remote so I, quote, wasn't distracted when I should be being active. Like exercising, I'm guessing. When he was at work. I'm going Uh, to work and I'm taking the remote with me. The fuck, Steve? Okay, so she is... Expected to stay home with the new baby for weeks, I'm guessing, but not have things like a television to watch during the day. This is power and control. That's, yeah. It's power and control. Yeah, that's not good. So we were married October 2015. Our daughter was 16 months old. A week later, he shoved me down a flight of stairs into our basement during an argument over whether or not I had washed a white shirt of his with a load of colors. It was about that time I completely disengaged with the relationship. All right. So this is where yours truly started exhibiting behavior that I'm less than proud of. I was incredibly unhappy Mm -hmm. in the marriage and felt trapped. Hard to believe. Hard to believe. By March of 2016, I was having an affair with a colleague. Uh, Not my finest hour. No. But it happened. Mm. This continued until the week before my birthday in August. Told the husband I was going out with the girls when in reality, I was going to see my side piece. In true Steve fashion, he hid his work phone in my car to track my whereabouts. He showed up at my affair partner's house at Uh, two in the morning with our child in the back seat of his car. Steve. And proceeded to beat on the door and push his way in. Steve. The whole scene was something out of an episode of Jerry Springer. Oh, I I guess you don't want to leave the kid alone at 2 a.m. I don't know. Why are you just have the conversation over coffee at 7 a.m.? Like the time to have the conversation is not busting into Romeo's house. with Agreed. Agreed. Steve. That is. Sounds like everyone could have handled things a little differently here. (laughs) Sherry cringes thinking back on what that was like. Yeah, like I'm it's, sure. It's it's bad it's bad behavior. We've we've all done it. Steve then disappears with our child, retreats to his mother's house about an hour away and wouldn't allow me to see our child. This was about the time I retained a shark of an attorney in order to get my baby back. Good. During the divorce, Steve's family set out on a smear campaign. I was painted into a Jezebel They stated I had a drug addiction, that I was a suicidal alcoholic. I was accused of being an absentee mother while they made Steve out to be a saint. Good times had by all. In the end, we wound up with 50-50 joint custody as I don't live in what's considered to be a quote-unquote mom state. At the time of the divorce, Steve was making six figures a year while I was making about $40,000. Steve wound up quitting his high-paying job in order to avoid paying me child support because he worked for that money. Yeah, that's a tactic. He really and truly is just a stand-up guy. It's fine, though. I managed to work my way up the ranks of my company and bought a house on my own within six months of the divorce, something Steve always told me I would never accomplish on my own. So So good on you, you, Sherry. Fuck you, Steve. God, I feel like a country song right now, (laughs) crying about how my wife left me, my dog died, my tractor broke down. But the story does have a happy ending, I promise. I spent a good chunk of time in therapy to work on what are clearly some deeply rooted issues with interpersonal relationships and healthy boundaries. To be honest, I still go because watching my parents manage to screw up my viewpoint on what is and isn't acceptable behavior in relationships in a pretty big way played a role in why I modeled the behavior that I did. Sherry winds up falling in love with one of her closest friends. He encourages me to grow as a person and is so supportive of everything I want to accomplish. He and my little lady are the best of friends as well. Nice. We were married in May and currently own a couple of rental properties and work for competing financial firms. We have a healthy dose of friendly competition, but rarely have arguments where we can't come to some sort of compromise. I am learning what it's like to be in a partnership, and I couldn't be happier. Good. Good job, Sherry. That's a hell of a story. Yep. Steve. I don't know. Who's worse, Steve or Chad? Uh. Looks like Sherry has improved her picker a little bit. Congratulations. Therapy has improved her picker. Therapy does Mm -hmm. improve your picker a lot. It really does, yeah. Sherry, thanks for that. That was awesome. 
It was a great letter. All right. I have one. This is great. I think the title of it in the email was Stealing the Farm. Oh, this is going to be good. What you got? Mm, Okay. So this is, uh, let me tell you about the giant patriarchal pile of flaming dumpsters that was my great grandparents divorce. Oh. Now let's I love grandma stories. Let's set the scene, yeah. It's the early 1930s in Traverse City, Michigan. Traverse City is known for having a microclimate that makes it particularly well suited to growing cherries. So out of the rolling hills of forest, white settlers have gradually carved out acre upon acre of orchards. One of those orchards belonged to my great great grandparents whose forebears had emigrated from Germany. They had one child, my great-grandmother, who, for the purposes of this tale, we'll call Bess. Ah, Bess. Good old Bess. Yeah. Bess was shy, tall, and homely, and at the time, Traverse City wasn't exactly a big town, so suitors weren't lining up around the block. Year after year passed by, and her parents were beginning to worry that their farm would be lost to poor management by their daughter, whom they had not prepared for the task. As far as they were concerned, she needed a husband to run the family farm, so that it could stay in the family for future generations. Wow. Okay. Very, um, ugh, ugh. All right, that sexism will come to bite them in the ass very soon. Then along came my great-grandfather, who I suppose we can call Richard for now. <laughs> <laughs> Big old dick. <laughs> he was a no-name farm boy from downstate whose Dutch parents had operated a small dairy farm that was bound to be inherited by his older brother. He swept Bess off her large feet and impressed her father. In short order, they got married, and as a wedding present, Bess's father signed the farm over to Richard to manage as his own, so Bess's parents could finally get some rest and enjoy their expected gaggle of grandchildren. The Great Depression was heating up, but they owned their farm outright and felt confident they could ride it out, especially now that they had a strapping young man running the farm. Sure. It didn't take long for Bess to get pregnant, and it seemed that she had finally managed to live up to the ideals her family and society held for her. She might not be delicate or dainty, but she was a wife, and she was soon to be a mother. Life was good. Okay. What a closed world. I mean, it's trashy divorces, so the story is going to go badly. It does. Yes. Yes. Um, (sighs) In in fact, it starts to go badly right now. No. However, Bess had noticed that the blush was off the rose with her new husband, Mm -mm. where once he had been gentlemanly and doting, now he was cold and distant. Oh, dick. He went into town regularly on business (gasps) and showed little concern for her or their unborn child. Nonetheless, she rationalized that with the ongoing economic turmoil, her husband was likely under a lot of stress trying to run a profitable farm. Sure. Stress. We're going to call it stress. In 1933, my grandmother was born. My great-grandfather was livid that my great-grandmother had failed to give him a son Mm. and blamed her. Mm -mm. Shortly thereafter, he filed for divorce. What? Yeah. 1933, (sighs) 34, he files for divorce. He accused Bess of adultery. Obviously, given the culture of the times and how tight-knit the community was, this was a huge scandal. Through the grapevine, my great-great-grandmother heard that Richard had, in fact, been seen carousing with women in town during those business Oh, for trips. sure. Uh-huh. Yeah, 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 yeah. Meanwhile, Bess had been out on the farm, pregnant for most of their short marriage. Unreal. As far as the judge was concerned, though, Richard's assertion that Bess had somehow cheated on him and that my grandmother was not his child was far more compelling testimony than Bess's statement that she had been a faithful and dutiful wife. The judge ruled in favor of Richard, issuing the divorce, declaring my grandmother illegitimate, and ordering Bess, her child, her mother, and now her infirm father, to vacate the farm. You are joking. Nope. (gasps) This is why it's called stealing the farm. Oh my god. So now Bess was a single mother during the Depression. She and her parents had a small amount of cash saved independent of the farm's finances, so they took what they could and moved downstate where Bess and her mother could find work as maids and cooks. My great-great-grandfather, heartbroken and already weakened, died shortly thereafter. Oh, this is so sad. Mm -hmm. My grandmother's earliest childhood memories were of struggling through the Depression, her mother and grandmother striving to put food on the table. She didn't know who her father was or what had happened. She often daydreamed about what it would be like to have a father and what her father was like. She only met him once. She and her mother were walking down the street in Flint, then one of Michigan's finest cities, and a man passed by, doffed his hat, and said, Bess... Bess replied, Richard, and they kept walking. (laughs) My grandmother looked up at her mother and asked, who was that man? That was your father, she replied. (sighs) My grandmother tried spinning around to get a better look, but he was was already gone. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. My grandmother grew up to have a wild, interesting, but difficult life. 
She was an incredibly intelligent woman, and had she experienced less trauma in her childhood and not been impoverished by her father's dirty dealings, could easily have been an incredibly successful person. Her father went on to remarry and continued running the orchard until he retired. What a fucker. Mm -hmm. He insisted that he had been cheated on by Bess until his death at 104 years old. Uh, He didn't even have the decency to die young, you asshole. My mother did eventually reach out to Richard's two children by his second wife. He had a son and a daughter. The son became a lawyer and the daughter became a doctor. Their education's funded by proceeds from their incredibly successful family farm. Unfucking believable The son remarked upon seeing pictures of my uncles how much they looked like his father. For a while, the family considered doing DNA tests, but given that the family farm had been donated to the county, it's now a historical site. Uh, there is no mention of Bess or my grandmother or how the farm came to belong to Richard. <sighs> There didn't seem to be much point in undergoing what was then a significantly expensive process. The fact that our part of the family has been left out of the prosperity and memory of the farm, that our ancestors settled, still sticks in the craw of many of my aunts and uncles, I would imagine. Oh, I'd be furious. Yeah. 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 For my part, while I feel sorry for my grandmother, whose potential, I think, was wasted because her single mother was unable to give her the same opportunities her half-sister and half-brother enjoyed, I'm also aware of the way that land... This is so woke. I love I love her ending here. Okay. I'm also aware of the way that land had been stolen before from the Ojibwe people who still live in the area. In the grander scheme of things, my family's incredibly trashy divorce story, which 1930s <laughs> had to have been a nightmare, Yeah, makes me appreciate the ways in which structural inequality perpetuates injustice and prevents people from living up to their potential. Also, intergenerational trauma is a thing. That's the fucking truth. So, wow. stealing the farm. That is... Worked out for Richard, man. That takes a lot of damn gall right there. Yeah, that's tough. Wow. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. This is a great tale. Yeah. Okay. I have a Thanksgiving-themed oh, good. trashy divorce. This is from our friend Amelia. Holy cranberries! <laughs> it's the tale of my parents' very trashy Thanksgiving divorce. My parents met in the late 60s and started dating. I don't think either of them necessarily thought the other was the one, but that didn't matter much because, oops, mom got pregnant. Hmm. They are both from devout Catholic families, Hmm. so their only option was to make it official. They got married, had my brother. Amelia arrives a year later. My parents did the best they could and provided a good stable life for us kids. As stable as a childhood could be in the 70s anyway. Yeah. Right, Gen Xers? It's true. (laughs) They got along well, but it was more of a friendly partnership than a romantic one. When my brother and I got to be teenagers, they would tell us they planned to amicably part ways after we graduated from college, because at that point they would have fulfilled their responsibilities to us. Interesting. Right. All of this made sense to my brother and me, so their impending divorce kind of became a running joke in our family. Hmm. Hmm. Unexpected. Okay. The joke stopped being funny during my junior year of college. Uh Uh-oh. The recession in the early 90s hit my dad's industry, and he'd gotten laid off. He found a new job in his field in another state. It didn't make any sense for my mom to leave her job and move with him, so they decided, naturally, it's a logical time to split. Okay. My dad moved to take the new job, and the plan was for him to come back over the upcoming Thanksgiving holiday to begin the legal proceedings and for us to spend one last Thanksgiving together as a family, just the four of us. Okay. Mom, dad, bro, and Amelia. This is very strange. Okay. Amelia's brother wisely ignored their wishes and blew off the entire thing. Cool. He took a road trip with his buddies instead. Cool. A friendly tip for me to you, says Amelia. If you have a choice to take a road trip or have a front row seat for your parents' divorce, take the road trip. Even if it means missing out on stuffing, because spoiler alert, I miss out on the stuffing anyway. (laughs) The big week came. Everything's in motion. My parents were going to the county clerk's office, which turned out to be a very sad office and a very sad strip mall in their state, (laughs) to file for divorce on Wednesday. The day before Thanksgiving. My mom's friend is going to go with them and serve as their witness. Wednesday morning, mom's friend calls. There's a medical emergency Uh and she can't make it. Oh, no. 
since it was the day before Thanksgiving, finding someone else to step in at the last minute right. was basically impossible. You know it's coming. I'm pretty sure I know it's coming. And, and they can't do it Thursday or Friday because it won't be open. Okay. Oh, no. I arrived oh, no, home Amelia. from college no. on Tuesday. No. I woke up Wednesday morning to mom and dad knocking on my bedroom door <laughs> saying, we hate to ask you this, but... Oh, my God. Yes. I served as witness to my parents' divorce filing on the day before Thanksgiving. Oh, my God. That is, um, you know, family values. My parents spent the rest of the day bickering and talking to each other through me. So not as amicable as maybe they had hoped. Yeah, nobody. (laughs) At that point, I'd already had enough. Being the witness to their divorce filing was one thing, but they were both understandably emotional about this, and I didn't want to be in the middle. I begged them to let me leave and stay at my friend Anita's house for the rest of the weekend. It was a chaotic situation in her house, too. Her parents had just surprised everyone by getting remarried to each other after being divorced for several years. Okay, what a bizarre... My dad was moving out. Anita's mom is moving in, despite all of my begging. My parents said, no, we want you here. Another friendly tip for me to you. If you are in the front row seat for your parents' divorce and you'd like to escape, don't ask permission. Right. Just leave. I've given up. I'm sure they wanted her there so that they wouldn't have to deal with each other as much. Like, she was just buffer. Like, run, run, Amelia, run. Amelia had given up meat a few years before this, so my mom promised that if I stayed, she'll make me a batch of vegetarian stuffing. It's a pretty cheap sellout, Amelia. But But we already know she did not end up getting the stuffing. That's true. Fine, I said. I'll stay. Carbs are my love language, you see. (laughs) Mine too, friend. Mine, Mine too. So my parents spent Thursday day cooking and dividing up the household goods. There was a lot of yelling. A lot of fighting, much fighting. Family heirlooms that obviously should belong to one or the other, fighting over it. Items that no one ever needed or wanted in the first place, fighting over it. The decrepit old turkey baster they had received as a wedding present 20 years before, barely worked, fighting over it. When it was time to eat, they called me out of my room where I'd been hiding. Where's the vegetarian stuffing? I asked. Oh, God. Mom's face fell. She forgot to make it. I honestly felt bad for her and dad, but I snapped and just started screaming at them. Yeah. (laughs) I had no business being there and in the middle of this. I called Anita. Things had gone sideways at her house, too. We made a plan to meet up in a parking lot since nothing was open that day. As I stormed out, I heard my mom's voice. Are you coming back? (sighs) Yes. Anita arrives in the parking lot with a slice of her grandma's sweet potato pie. We sat on the hood of her car in that parking lot and ate it, thankful for each other. My parents got through the divorce and have remained good friends. For Christmas that year, I gave each of them a new turkey baster and threw the old one away. (laughs) I am thankful that my parents are both still around and that I have a good relationship with them. But after that year... I told them that I am reclaiming Thanksgiving as a day when I get to do what I want. Mm -hmm. They understood. We make an effort to spend time with each other, just not on Thanksgiving. To this day, there's no better way for me to spend Thanksgiving than at Anita's boisterous table, exchanging a knowing look over a slice of sweet potato pie. Still, I'm going to cry, still thankful for each other. Hmm. Happy Thanksgiving, friends, old and new. May you spend it in a way that fills both your heart and your belly. <laughs> Thank you, Amelia. Yeah. Witness to your parents' trashy divorce is pretty shitty. That's really, really not cool. But pie. Pie. All the pie. Sure. Boy. Well, there we go. Thank you for your listener letters. Thanks, everybody. We really, really appreciate people sharing their stories with us. And keep sending them in. Mm-hmm. I think holidays might be kind of a fun listener letter bonus drop just because I know I need something to get me through mm-hmm. the crazy days of, I mean, not turkey based or Amelia crazy, but yeah, families are rough. Yeah. Hey, happy Thanksgiving. Happy, happy Thanksgiving. Pie day. Happy mashed potato and pie day. And if you are outside of the U.S., happy Thursday or Friday, depending on where you are on the international dateline. 
I feel like there's, oh, don't forget, now's a great time to do a little Christmas gift giving. Um, we have tickets for our live show at Vinkman's December 29th at Vinkman's.com mm-hmm. for your very trashy new year. Yep. Super exciting. Also, if you're looking for any Trashy Divorces merch, yes. head on over to TrashyDivorces.com. There's a merch link. It'll take you there. You can get any bit of trash merch candy that mm-hmm. you want for yourself or for a friend for yep. Christmas. True story. I've made the list for Christmas. I'm now thinking about it. So right. I'm I think we have four designs up now, but we're we're hoping to get some more thrown together. And yeah. So check those out. Up there. Everybody enjoy your day, whether you're with your friend Anita or your loved ones or your drunk uncles. Or your cat. Or your cat. Or wherever you are. Enjoy your day. We cannot tell you how um, grateful and thankful we are for you this year or 11 months in this year has been a hell of a ride with trashy divorces none of it happens without your awesome ears and hearts and contributions and thank you from trashy divorces headquarters to you you fill our hearts and our bellies not our bellies but (laughs) both with pie with trash candy pie trash candy pie big love big thanks big gobble gobble Keep it trashy. Always keep it trashy. Loose pants, y'all. Oh, Loose yeah. pants. Yeah, yeah. Do some Cannot yoga pants. Yeah. Stress enough. Spandable waist. How loose you want those pants to be. Got this. We believe in you, trash pandas. We believe in you. Thanks for listening. Trashy Divorces is written and produced by us, Stacy and Alicia, for Hemlock Creatives. You can contact us at trashydivorces at gmail.com. Our art is by Sydney V. Smith. Find her at sydneyvsmith at carbonmade.com. And our music is used with permission of Ratsy. You can find her on Instagram at Ratsy Store. Check out episode sources, photos, soundtracks, and more at trashydivorces.com. Enjoy early ad-free releases, bonus divorce stories, weekly trashy tidbits, limited series like Trashy Tutors, Fun With Done, and Side Pieces, and a whole lot more by joining us at patreon.com slash trashydivorces. We have finally curated trash candy for you at the two, five, ten, and $25 level. And we have merchandise. You can get your Trashy Divorces gear at bit.ly slash trashy merch. And thank you to What a Maneuver for doing such a great job with our cloths. We appreciate all your ratings and reviews. If you leave us a five-star review on iTunes, send us a picture of it. We'll ship you some Trashy Divorces stickers and such anywhere in the world. Don't feel left out because you're in the Netherlands, Brazil, Singapore, Tanzania, Iceland, or any of the other 154 countries and counting where people are listening. That is Trashy Divorces divorces at gmail.com and last but not least come play with us on social we're at trashy divorces everywhere instagram you can find us which alicia mostly runs twitter which stacy mostly runs and on facebook which we split we also have a trashy divorces discussion group on facebook if you want to chat with other trashy divorces listeners thanks again for listening keep Keep it it trashy trashy, y'all